Hi everyone, and um, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this webinar on designing sports programs with and for refugee women. Um, we're going to get started um, already, and then I'm sure more people will be joining throughout the session. Um, my name is Esther Jones Russell, I'm the head of policy and social inclusion at Fair Network, um, and this webinar is part of the Inspires project, which is a two-year EU-funded project led by the Fair Network, uh, together with our partners in Italy, so that's Jaya and Wisp, Organisation Earth in Greece. Uh, Monoliku in Finland and Champions on the Grenzen in Germany. So the main aims of the Inspires project are to build the capacity of organisations and coaches who are using sport as a tool uh, for refugee inclusion and integration, uh, and also to make sure that refugees are involved directly in the creation and implementation of these sports programmes, with a particular focus on refugee women and girls. I'm sure we're all very aware and following the devastating news that is coming out of Ukraine at the moment and the ongoing um, situation in Afghanistan, all of which serves as a stark reminder of the growing number of people globally who are being forced to flee their countries um, and seek refuge in new places, and the urgent need for meaningful interventions to support their integration and their welcome in these new countries. Um, and sport certainly plays a role within this. We've seen this in Afghanistan where women and girls engaged in sport are being directly targeted by the Taliban, um, and the, how the global football community has rallied together to help with uh, those affected being evacuated from the country, led tirelessly by Khalida Popal, who's the former um, captain of the Afghanistan women's national team, um, and using sport as a tool to support uh, people's integration upon arrival. Um, and we will actually hear in a moment from Freshta about her first-hand experience of this in Catalonia. So bearing all that in mind, this webinar comes at quite a timely moment. Um, as we're bringing experts from across the field to share their experience um, and best practices in using sport as a tool for integration and to influence migration policy. You're going to be led through this uh, event by the very capable hands of the broadcaster and journalist and good friend of affairs, Ben Jacobs. Um, you can also put questions to each of the speakers, so please do put your questions into the chat box that you should be able to see along the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ben, and I hope you really enjoy the session. So thank you very much indeed. Of course, our theme is inspires, and I hope that my jumper is inspiring all of you to be bright and energetic and ask plenty of questions. And it's definitely rivaling as the brightest Esther's curtains as well. So we've got off to a very energetic and colourful start. And of course, the topic is very serious and we will delve into it over the course of the next 90 minutes or so, talking a little bit about designing sports programmes with refugee women in mind, some of the sensitivities around refugees in particular, who are of course victims, and it's important that we consistently stress and educate around that. And as we're seeing with Ukraine, how sport can use its platform to unify and take a powerful stance and also strong messaging, which is replicated in other areas. And when we see sport lead on the political front, on the educational front, not only is it playing its part and the athletes within it, but it's also reaching a different, younger audience. And as that audience sees the messaging through sport, it can be educated as well. So it's, again, really crucial to start this discussion by realising how important sport is in educating around refugees, whether male or female, and also designing tailored sports programmes that are respectful of the cultural sensitivities that can face young women, particularly in certain parts of the world, like the Middle East, and as sure that we'll come on to that throughout the course of the next 90 minutes or so. So we've got a lot to delve into, and we'll start with a focus in a minute on Afghanistan. We'll then move on to a presentation from Anna Farello, who will talk to us about the co-creation program that she's been behind, and we welcome your questions on that. We'll then move on to partnerships and how some of the major sports teams can be part of those partnerships. And we're delighted to be joined by Lucy Mills, who is an Inspires developer and part of the Barcelona Foundation. And then we'll finish with a panel on the role of sport in refugee policy. And we have Des Tomlinson and Nagin Ravand, and I'll tell you more about them a little bit later. But the most important thing, other than complimenting my jumper in the chat, is to make sure that you use the Q&A button in the bottom right hand corner to ask as many questions as you can. We really want you to feel a part of this. So as our panelists give you their valuable 
and expert insight, please do make sure that you put your questions in the Q&A panel on the bottom right hand corner. And I should also remind everyone that this session is recorded too, and we will be able to send you a copy as well. So without further ado, let's get things underway. And as I alluded to, we're going to be beginning with an Afghan refugee testimony. And Foreshta Rafat is our first speaker. She'll be in conversation with myself. Fareshta, really inspiring individual, a human rights activist and a journalist who fled Afghanistan very recently in September 2021 after the Taliban's reoccupation. She's now in Barcelona and she's been a part of the Barca Foundation's sport program. So we're going to learn a bit about her story now over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. In the picture with Fareshta is Lucy Mills as well from the Barca Foundation, a good friend of mine and a huge champion for gender equality for refugee rights. And Lucy will input as well. But Fareshta, great to see you, first of all. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you begin by just giving us an overview of the topic that we're talking about? So we're specifically focusing on designing a sports program with refugee women in mind. As a refugee woman, what is important? How can sport help us ultimately educate around refugees and welcome refugees into a society? What do you think are some of the main tenets for success in this area? Thank you so much uh, for the information about me. As a refugee, when every month day I go to the football club to play with Lucy, with other refugees from different countries, I spend all of my energy. I forgot every negative uh, situation that we have, every problem that we have in Spain as a refugee, as an immigrant. But uh, I think this the football helps all of the refugee to inspire every day and to forget the problems and to think that they are also one part of the social in that, that society that they live. Because of that, I think that the footballers or sport is more than, than a, a sport for us. I apologize that my English is not good, but uh, there is a home with that. We have a home between all of other refugees in football. We have a team, we have a lot of friends and we know each other, we talk with each other and we try to spend the time better. And when I share my experience as a refugee in here with another friends from uh, Syria or from, from uh, Morocco, I feel, she feels that she's not alone and this problem that we had or she has, uh, this is not for herself. We all have the same problem and we can try to uh, help each other better. First of all, your English is great, much better than my diary or Pashto. So don't go putting down the English. That was brilliant and an excellent introduction. Second of all, let's go back a little bit and just learn some context about your story. We know why you were prompted and forced ultimately out of Afghanistan because of the Taliban occupation, but tell me a little bit about how difficult it was to leave because a lot of the Afghan refugees that I speak to in the world of sport, despite the difficult circumstances, they don't want to leave. Afghanistan is still your home. So how hard was the decision to leave and how did you end up in Spain? Thank you so much. I never thought that uh, I will be a refugee. I always thought that I will stay in my country to change the situation with my sisters. But uh, when the Taliban gave the village of the Afghanistan, not the capital of the cities, they <clears throat> uh, send a lot of message, a lot of letters to our families, to our organizations that you, we will kill you because you do something or you're activist against Islam because they think human uh, rights, uh, gender equality or feminism is against the Islam. Because of that, when I work with the women shelter, women protection centers for the women who, was un who were under the violence, the Taliban every week talk with our boss, Sarah Bogzad, that this situation is not good, we will kill you. And after that, when the Taliban gave my city, Balkis, I must uh, went to the Herat because in Balkis they were killed. 
And after the two days, they stopped my father that where is your daughter? And uh, uh, tell us uh, about her house. My father told my daughter is fake. She went to the Iran and she's not in the country. I was in Herat uh, the, tomorrow morning after the 14th of the August when the uh, Herat uh, fell down. When I go outside, I, I saw that my home and a lot of homes about, from my friends that who work with the, an international organization and who work with the government of the Afghanistan as a lawyer, as a principal manager, the Taliban marked our house to, to find us and then to kill everyone by one by one by one. After that, I suggest to go to the Kabul. In that time, one of my friends that I worked with her, Monica Bernabe, she's a famous journalist in Spain. I talked with her that my situation is not good. She told me I will put you in this vacation uh, flights. And uh, the, ter the terrible time was that for me that my parents cannot join me to come to Spain. They told me that fresh that the Kabul airport situation is not good for us and we are too old. You go and uh, make a future for yourself. We will stay in this country and our wish is that you be safe. Because of that, I mm, came to Spain. I became refugee that I never think about the, a refugee world, what does meaning. I came to Spain and now I'm in Spain and I try to change the situation for myself and make a future that my parents give a promise to me. And I think that's really well put. And thank you for being so candid with what is clearly a difficult story. And, you know, for those listening or if you haven't been to Afghanistan, it's really important to note that refugees are not always, in fact, more often than not, they're not leaving as families. Sometimes it's just the younger kids. Some get out because they've got a route, others don't. And where they end up is not through any kind of choice. So then when we're pulling it back to sport, sport is the unifier. Sport is something that regardless of language, regardless of location, regardless of where an individual or a family are, they can look up to and say, that's escapism, that's social life, that is friendship, that is a common language. And that's the sort of starting point why sport is so powerful because anyone can play a game of any sport, but let's specifically talk about football. And you don't need to know who's your teammate, who's opposite you. You just need to know that there's a football and two goals. And then from there, you can smile and you can laugh and you have the opportunity to be integrated into a community and make friends. And I guess for Eshta, that's what happened to you because when you got to Spain, you found the Barca Foundation. How important has that program been to you? For me and for my sister who lives with me in here, with their families, too much important because um, my sister became depressed when she arrived to Spain. And uh, every day she crying. At the first day that they told us, you can go to a football team. And we went after that, we, we meet as a first person, Lucy, in beer. My sister, for the first time, she uh, she tried to uh, do any sport, any type of sport, because in Afghanistan, I, I do fitness, but for, for her was the first time. We became crying after that, when we talking with our parents, that father, mother, dad, mom, today we had football at the first time we was in the uh, green ground. My father thought, this is the situation that you must enjoy. Don't worry about Afghanistan. More than me for my sister was a very different experience. And every Wednesday that I said, I'm a little uh, tired, I don't want to go. She said, no, fresh, let's go. In the, in the past times, uh, for me, I'm 27 years old and she is 37 years old. In 37 years, years old that I had, I didn't have this opportunity. And it's a good opportunity for me to forget all the problem. Because of that, we enjoy a lot and football is more than a sport for us. Yeah, well put. And I think that family connection that you're able to have through sport in Spain, especially in the absence of your wider family, is really powerful. And I'm wondering what your message is 
to those less familiar with a refugee's journey. And I think that in the context of Ukraine, people's perspective on defining a refugee, understanding a refugee is going to change because in that context, we're being shocked by current events and we're seeing the kind of devastation in real time but because somehow, badly, wrongly, of course, but the word Taliban has been almost normalized. We know it's shocking. We know they're terrorists, but they've been around for much longer than this Putin offensive. And when people look at a refugee from a place like Afghanistan, they perhaps don't define it in the same way as they will towards a refugee from Ukraine. So how important do you think it is or what is your message behind defining what a refugee is because as i said right at the top to me a refugee is a victim to me a refugee is somebody that doesn't want to leave their country to me a refugee is somebody that every person every business including sport should be going out of their way to help and to integrate and we need to take away any stigma behind the word and the definition of refugee and i'm wondering if you agree and what your kind of messages around how we perceive the definition of a refugee. Uh, we have a point in English. It says that so here you are, two foreign from home, two foreign from here, and not enough for both. This is the refugee situation. And if the day I think if uh, the football finish, what can I do? What will be happen for us? How we can enjoy the life? This is a little part of our uh, happiness in, as a refugee. My message is to all of you that uh, please, I think every refugee must access to the sport, to the free sport, without any money, to, necessarily to pay any money or that. And please prepare this situation, this best situation for all the refugees in, not in Barcelona, not in Madrid, not in the capital of the countries that who accept the refugees, the immigrants. In the, every village that they live, in every city, small or big city that they live. And they, they have to understand that there is a place for us that we can go and enjoy uh, the football and we can do a sport. This is my message and my request to all of you to do some things for this because I know a lot of Afghan refugees who are in Spain, who are in another cities near to the Portugal or, or in the north, they didn't go to uh, football because there is no Ramasa, there is no maybe Barca Foundation to prepare for them uh, any type of a sport that they like. But I, I think that it's too good if we have this good uh, situation, this good uh, opportunity for all the refugees in every country. Don't forget, if you've got any comments or questions, then put them in the chat in the bottom right. We've got just under 10 minutes left. And Lucy, by the way, who's sitting very patiently there, will be back a little bit later to talk about the Barcelona Foundation. And you can learn how to get involved in that as well. But for Esther, I'm interested specifically to focus in now on refugee women, which is obviously a big part of this seminar and session, because how sport helps refugee women and particularly refugee women from certain parts of the world like Afghanistan and areas of the Middle East as well has to be very specific, doesn't it? Because there are cultural sensitivities. And right at the top, Esther mentioned Khalida Popel, the former captain of the Afghan women's national team. And just by founding an Afghan women's national team, already there was a target on her back. And when the Taliban first occupied Afghanistan, she had to flee. And with some refugees, obviously, they can flee a war-torn area and they don't have these cultural sensitivities. But for you in Afghanistan, you would have grown up effectively under threat if you were seen in public walking back from a football practice after a curfew or dark. There would no doubt have been people in your circle, in your village that didn't like a woman playing in a football kit and so on. So all around the world with women specifically, we see these cultural stigmas and sensitivities geared unfortunately to stopping some women from certain parts of the world playing sport. So perhaps you could give me an insight into some of the cultural sensitivities that you faced and have had to overcome set almost to stop you from playing sport back in Afghanistan. 
uh, in Afghanistan, we have a bad culture that thinks that the woman and the girl must be at home. They can do anything in outside the door, even football, even sport. And I think in this situation that the woman who don't access to just take, the woman don't access to university, to his, the girls don't access to his school. Football is, sport is too much that we're talking about that. Because at first I think for Afghan women is necessary that they can speak, they can work outside the home, they can speak with freedom and they can do a job or access to their school, they, they go to school. Because of that, I know that in this situation, we just have, uh, in not in Kabul or Herat, in the small cities, we just have the fitness clubs that they are in a house of a woman or a person. And uh, we don't have, in my information that I have, we don't, we don't have any type of the clubs or any type of the sport in the cities. And one point that I want to add, before the Afghanistan fell down, for example, in my province that's two hours near to Herat in the West, we didn't have any type of their sports. For example, football team or team of the volleyball or team of the basketball. We just have the football team, the sports team that who everyone understands about in, in the big cities of Afghanistan. And the problem is that uh, unfortunately now we don't have in any type of the cities because the, the Taliban issue is against the woman, against of the every freedom a woman must have, have that. But uh, I think in this time we cannot do anything for them because Unfortunately, we don't have government in Afghanistan and the tourist people are, they are uh, manage this country. But uh, in the, maybe in the, after the two or one years that we know what is the Taliban issue, how the international countries can do something in our country. And that time we can say, okay, now we can create again, a sport in, a sport club in, uh, Iraq and Baltis and Kabul. But in this time, I, I think that it's impossible. And hopefully that changes very soon. And what can you do from afar? So now you're in Spain and you're safe, which is the most important thing. And you're looking to settle and that will take time, but you are gonna have one eye still on home and your friends and family back there. And I know that in addition to being part of the Barca Foundation, you're also a journalist and a human rights activist. So in those areas of human rights activism and journalism, what do you think you can do over the coming months to keep pushing for change in the right direction, even though politically Afghanistan is more volatile than ever? Mm, I'm too weak to talk about the Afghanistan situation because in my mind, the things that we that can do is that we do not recognize Taliban as a government. And after that, the international countries can push Taliban to accept the accept a democratic uh, government that all the people who do they have experience, they had they can do something in Afghanistan joined to that uh, government. With the Taliban, we cannot do anything in Afghanistan for women. But uh, the things that we can do is by, uh, by, by the electronic, by the internet. By the internet, the things that uh, we can uh, do for the Afghan women is that prepare something for them to do a sport at their home or uh, to have a hiding place to sport together. For example, we have a lot of place in the big cities like Herat, like uh, Kabul, like Mazar, a lot of fitness, a lot of gyms, fitness gyms that they have a uh, very uh, big uh, ground. We can talk with the woman, with the managers of that uh, clubs that you can do this sport, we try to support you. We try to prepare something for you to do better that. Without this, I can. I think we cannot do anything for Afghan women, and this is my biggest uh, worrying things. 
I mean, you say that and you're absolutely right because you've lived there and you've got the context and that is a slightly sobering and somber thought, but it's also important to stress that you are doing a lot just by coming on here, telling your story, by using your platforms, by being part of the Barcelona Foundation. So well done because when we hear a refugee like yourself talk lucidly, talk past uh, passionately and educate us in this way that does more than you think because it, it puts your message out there globally uh, it attracts other people towards programs they might not know about like the Barca Foundation program it inspires younger women who may be uh, shyer to speak out and that's also why Khalida has done such a great job because even though the situation is so difficult by taking a stand even if it's troubling and problematic it inspires others and that is what you're doing by joining us here. So congratulations and thank you for joining us. And I have one final question, which might be the most important question of everything. And be aware that Lucy is sitting right next to you. Having moved to Catalonia recently, are you a Barcelona fan? <laughs> yes. Are you a Barcelona um, you need to come now. She's going to come now. So that, that means yes. No, but Lucy promised to me that uh, in next uh, La Liga, uh, she will uh, prepare some tickets for me. <laughs> <laughs> for me. You have to buy her support. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly a glowing endorsement of Barcelona, was it? She's only a fan if she gets the tickets for free. <laughs> that I mean, the uh, new camp was two and a uh, and it's interesting for me, but uh, also I called my nephew. She's one. Uh, he's one of the most uh, uh, fans of the Barca uh, football, Barcelona team. Uh, he became crying that uh, said, "Aunt, please join because I'm not here. Please say hi to PK because I'm not here." <laughs> and I, it was two, uh, two part. One part. I was happy, but another part I was trying to why my my nephew is not here. Here's the thing you need to say to your nephew: forget Barcelona men, they're rubbish at the moment. Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> but Alexia Putas and Barcelona women are doing amazing. So try and get him into Barcelona women. But it's a great club anyway, and we will obviously delve in more serious detail into the Barca Foundation with Lucy a little bit later. But for now, we'll move on to the next session. But for Esther, I just want to say thank you again. It's been brilliant hearing your story, and thank you for being so honest. And thank you so much for your passion, because my English is... <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> well, well, you're learning Spanish and Catalan, so... Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, again, thank you for Esther. Thanks, Lucy, for facilitating as well. And we'll speak to you a little bit later. And don't forget as well, in that chat facility or in your Q&A button, you'll see two of them and either are fine. If you've got any comments, then you can get involved. We really want your questions, your thoughts, even if they're retrospective after seeing a session, please do engage so we can get everybody involved. And as I say, instead of trying to turn on your microphone, put your questions either in the chat or the Q&A button and I'm across them and we'll be able to put them to our panelists. So let's move on now, having set things up with a first person testimony from Fereshta. We now have a presentation more focused on the program itself. And this comes from Anna Ferrello, who is an Inspires developer. And she's gonna talk us through the co-creation program in Australia. And Inspires developers have been recruited to support the implementation of this particular project. So what they do essentially is they research good practices from uh, across the globe, specifically practices that promote refugee women's involvement in developing sports programs. So what Anna's going to do is talk us through one of the projects specifically in Australia and Anna's also completing a PhD in sport for development and peace at Loughborough University, which is not too far from me in Leicester. So if we're talking about football fans, then Anna, you have to be a Leicester City fan. If I find out you're a Nottingham Forest fan or a Derby fan, also close to Loughborough, then I'm going to have to end this presentation very no, well. No. I, I do get a little bit of a pass though, because I'm at the London campus. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not based in Loughborough, but, um, but yeah, thank you so much, Ben, for the introduction. Um, so I am going to give a very brief presentation uh, on a program that I researched and found. So 
this is not this is not my program. I did not take part in it. I am merely reporting reporting on it. Um, so it's actually an academic paper, and this makes sense possibly because of my um, background and current position as a PhD student. And it was a study done by Carla Leggetti and uh, two of her colleagues in Australia in Melbourne. And uh, I'm actually thinking I can probably add as an attachment the, the article, because I think it would be really helpful if people want to engage with it more, because I only have a few minutes here and uh, can't dive into every single aspect of it. So anyways, um, I'll just begin speaking about this, this program. The basis of this program, um, it's really a co-creation program. So it's an activist approach, a co-creation approach with African Australian refugee background young women in football. So it's a, it's a bit of a long title, but um, hopefully you'll understand the cycle. So what, what was the project? The project was an original research collaboration between a university in Melbourne and an NGO in Melbourne called Football Empowerment. And the reason that the researchers at Melbourne wanted to collaborate with this program was because they wanted to explore the potential of an activist co-creative approach to a sport program with young women with refugee backgrounds. And the article, the, the academic article, is basically a report of what the collaboration resulted in, what the researchers learned and what the participants learned throughout the process. And so who were the participants exactly? They were young refugee women, as I mentioned, living in Australia, but coming from different countries in Africa. They were age 14 to 25, and they were already participants in football empowerment. So basically the researchers went into the, the NGO and then asked for you know, young females who were already on the program. Uh, football empowerment is a program that aims to address social issues facing young people from disadvantaged communities through football. Uh, okay, so what else about the project? This idea of co-creation is the backbone of it. Co-creation is all about working together with marginalized groups to create something that primarily benefits them and addresses their needs. And the target groups, in this case, young refugee women, they were involved in every single step of the process. So this is from the conceptualization of the project all the way through the monitoring, evaluation, and learning. They were never left out. Uh, and so that's, that's really what's at the core of this co-creation uh, idea or approach. So this program happens in two phases. It spans six months. So the first three months were all about building a foundation. So this was between the researchers and the young refugee women. They participated in tasks that involved tree writing, like uh, sentence stem finishing. They drew pictures, they wrote journals, and they even took pictures about kind of their experiences in sport at the moment in the football empowerment program and outside of that. And then they had collaborative meetings every week to kind of talk about some of the things they were experiencing. What are the barriers that they're experiencing? How are they feeling in football empowerment and outside of it? What things that are contributing to their overall experience, sporting experience in Melbourne. So that was all about building a foundation. The second half of the program, the last three months, were the more activism, was the more activism approach. So the participants and the researchers worked together to analyze the patterns, the themes that came up in phase one. So what were some of those recurring, you know, those motifs from the writing task, the pictures, the journals, top the photographs. What are those patterns? And then basically the young women, they decided to come up with a workshop. They wanted to create, they wanted to design a workshop for female coaches to try to address some of the issues and the barriers that came up in phase one. So phase two was about design, deciding that they wanted to do a workshop, designing it, practicing it, rehearsing it, and then eventually delivering it. Um, so what were some of the findings? What were some of the outcomes of this study? The, one of the main things were the social bonds and the social capital that participants gained. And I think Breshta talked about this beautifully. She said, we have to help each other better. And solidarity was a big finding from this study. And it wasn't just the participants you know, bonding with one another, it was also including the researcher because it was so collaborative. So there was this idea of struggling together in the article that I found really powerful, that they were able to overcome 
some of the challenges that they were experiencing since they arrived in Australia. Uh, the main author, Carla, she was originally from Brazil. And so she was also an immigrant into Australia. So they had that shared kind of immigrant experience, although of course um, from different inception points, I suppose. Um, but that solidarity was really important. Another aspect or another main finding was that there wasn't enough female representation in football empowerment. So the NGO itself was not the best place that it could be for those young refugee women because they didn't have the, the role models to look up to in there. And so that kind of also sparked this idea for the workshop, right? That there wasn't enough representation. And the workshop was successful for the female coaches that they, that they worked with. And the young refugee women were able to share with these coaches and collaborate with them on ideas that they had for the future. How can we work to make women's sports better? And because of their participation in this research study, the young refugee women have the knowledge, they have the tools on how they can increase participation for young girls and young women in football and beyond. Um, it's not just applicable to football. And then the final main finding I want to mention is that they found research, well, they realized really that research and sport programming does not have to be centered on the adult or centered on the researcher. There's often this inherent power dynamic between the people creating a sports program or researching sports programs and the people who are participating in them. And it doesn't have to be like that. It can be this truly collaborative approach where there are no power dynamics, there's no hierarchy, and basically everybody is equal and everybody has an equal say in what happens in the sport. Um, in terms of being able to transfer or replicate you know, this study into other other areas. Um, there are just a few things to consider, and some of them have been touched on already by Ben and by Freshman. Um, main one being, where are your participants coming from? How many countries are represented? What are some of the cultural barriers that they that they might be facing? And you might find that they're different when you actually speak to them, right? What you perceive that their the barriers and facilitators are may not actually be what they're experiencing. So there really is that need to build rapport with them relate to them on as many levels as possible and get in get the information that both of you need, right? They can learn from you and you can learn from them. It has to be a two-way street. And then again on that similar note, that the participants, they have to be the ones kind of taking the lead. They they are the experts in their own experience. So they should be the ones that are the kind of the driving force behind behind the program. Um, and the researcher slash you know, sports programmers, they're really there to facilitate. They can be the ones that provide resources and kind of guide, guide what happens, but they don't have to be in control all the time. And I think that's, that's really challenging for researchers and sports programmers, but really interesting that control then gives the participants, the young refugee women, so much more agency and empower and then empowers them to do what what they know they can or maybe what they don't think they can um, and that's really important uh, and then finally just that i just want to mention that those tasks from phase one that i mentioned so the journal writing the picture drawing the photographs um, all of that stuff in theory could be done in participants native language it's just that a, an interpreter would would be required if, if that were the case. So that's just another thing. Uh, so just a couple main takeaways to to end this short presentation. Um, this project provides a really nice framework that can be used with young female refugees from various backgrounds. And again, I'll um, I'll try to link it into the chat so that people have access to it. And you can kind of see in there they have a really nice table that lays out what happens every single week of the program in phase one what happened every single week in the program in phase two. And I think that that can be a really good kind of skeleton framework for, um, for any program moving forward and how it can be kind of utilized for different, slightly different populations. Um, again, just really want to hit home that participants have to be leading the process here uh, and that it has to be a, a really collaborative, you know, a really collaborative approach between the people in, in charge, traditionally sports programmers, researchers, and you have and then finally, just the message that co-creating a program can be effective in the 
delivering a really nice customized program to your target group, and it can instill a sense of empowerment and activism. And, um, cool. I think I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Anna, thank you very much indeed. I know that Loretta was asking in the chat if there's any corresponding slides or transcripts. So we will try and get that link that Anna mentioned into the chat so you can delve further. And I'm sure that Anna's happy to be connected offline as well if anyone needs any more documentation or has any more thoughts. And then Celeste Williams has asked an important question, I think, Anna, which I'm sure you'll be able to answer. And she writes, if starting a new program for young women in sports, is there an ideal age group with which to start? Oh, that's a great question. I think I, I can speak at least to, to this program. So it was geared towards uh, a bit older. So 14 to 25 was the age group here. And I think that worked really well because the participants had to take in a lot of information about what it means to, to listen to one another, to you know, how to, how to create the workshop <clears throat> that would naturally be a bit more difficult for younger, for younger children. Um, if, you're, if you are working with younger children, I think that, yeah, the co-creation piece is a little bit more challenging. Um, I think we're like a lot of control to do a five years old or six years old would end a bit differently than if you're giving it to people a bit older. So the age is important. Um, yeah, I would say that this age group like teenagers and, and young people in their early 20s would probably be ideal for, for a coaching. Just mainly for me, you mentioned it's really important in these programs for those involved. So in this case, refugee women to have input and lead, but it can be quite daunting for a refugee to come to a new place, understand what's available to them. So again, in this context, that might be sport and then feel that they've got the voice to shape something or change something. So how do you get over that shyness and encourage feedback to ensure that these programs keep improving in a way that do remain refugee led rather than everybody in a room being very strategic and then not really knowing, particularly as I say, with a shyer kind of refugee or group culturally that isn't that, comfortable saying this isn't quite right for us we'd prefer it like something else we want this change we want that change are you sort of surveying are you speaking to them one-on-one -on -one? are you just running the program over and over and over again and learning from each one like how do you ensure that the refugees involved are actually having the most important voice in all of this yeah that's a great question um at least in this study I think that's exactly what the first three months were all about. So they spent, you know, seven to twelve weeks figuring out, you know, how how can we make this a nice environment for people to start voicing their concerns and their likes and their dislikes. And so that's what those tasks were trying to draw out. So you know, writing a journal, um, drawing pictures, and having prompts related to them, going out and taking pictures. They're very seemingly simple tasks, uh, but I think that. You know, once you start, once someone gives you a camera, it's let's go take some pictures of things that you really like. You know, maybe it is a new, it is a new concept, but it's something different than what you're usually taught. And I'm sure that, you know, well, I, I can't say I'm sure. I would imagine that somebody with refugee background being given a camera or something like that would potentially be really delighted to have that opportunity, um, as opposed to maybe how they're typically treated in, in other situations. Uh, so I think breaking down those barriers early on creating that sense of solidarity from the beginning. So the one-on-ones might be a little, can, can be challenging because of that potential power dynamic. But when you get a group of people who have similar background together, they all they all have that in common, right? So that there's that universality that they can kind of um, they can share. And I think that can open up the possibilities for, for really productive um, work. Great stuff, Anna. Thank you very much for joining us. Really fascinating presentation, getting into a case study of an individual program in Australia. And stick around as well, because at the end of our seminar, approximately 5.30, or given it's me hosting, it's normally closer to six o'clock, because I always like to try and steal an extra minute or two with our speakers. But we'll have all the speakers up for about 10 minutes or so at the end and you can put your questions to them so again use the chat facility or use the q a button 
and make sure that you get involved with your thoughts so we can make this as interactive and engaging as possible. So we'll move swiftly on now. And if you've joined us late, I should point out that you've missed a really powerful testimony from Fareshto Rafat, who's a human rights activist and journalist who fled Afghanistan back in 2021. We've just been through the co-creation program in Australia with Anna. And now we come back to the Barcelona Foundation of which Fareshta is a part and we'll learn more about the business side of things. In other words, how does a big team like Barcelona get involved with partnerships such as an Inspires program? How do they choose who to work with? How do they formulate a program? How do they lean on experts from a certain field versus bring their own brand and personality to a particular program, in this case, obviously, for refugee women. And I'm delighted to say that to delve into the element of partnerships that comes with programs such as this, I'm joined now by a good friend of mine, Lucy Mills, who is part of the Barcelona Foundation and also an Inspires developer as well. Lucy, great to see you. I suppose I should point out, because some people might be new, that as you're looking at the screen, Lucy's on the right and Fareshta, who we've already heard from, <laughs> left so you're getting a two for one unfortunately I'm still in the shot as well but other than that <laughs> definitely a good way to start Lucy as I say it's really good that you can join us we've already heard Fareshta's take what about yours what attracted the Barcelona program to the Inspires development project and how are you synced with it specifically yeah, thanks so much, Ben, and thanks to Fair Network for organising this event, and thanks to Fresh for taking time to come. And uh, we actually have our training sessions on Wednesday nights, so we do see each other on a regular basis. We'll talk about that later. But um, I think, first of all, um, what 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 we love about Fair Network is that um, it's the creation of these spaces for dialogue, for learning from um, uh, other organisations. We we actually came to know about Fair Network um, quite recently. A colleague of mine, La uh, Laura Santis, contributed to a webinar a couple of years ago on employability issues for youth migrants in Catalonia. And really from there, um, the conversation continued and we felt very aligned on, um, on this idea of collaborating on working together. Um, and so the, the Inspires project, the opportunity for me to become a developer on the project and to research different initiatives it, um, that are uh, working to include women and girls um, in sports and physical activity, particularly refugee women and girls, was a really good opportunity because it enabled Barca Foundation to, uh, to, to get to know uh, a, a load more um, in different initiatives, um, smaller initiatives that are happening here in Catalonia that then we could then um, transplant into the conversation on a European level. So um, it's been a it's been a really positive experience of fair network. I think that is a huge responsibility to um, to be a network, and um, that the staff and and the staff um, they take up that responsibility of convening and creating space and facilitating in a in a really really admirable way. So um, I think we are, we have to really give credit um, to fair network for doing this. Um, the um, if I could talk from a Barca Foundation perspective and our prioritization of, of, of uh, people with refugee and migrant backgrounds, this has been a priority of, of the club and the foundation um, for the last five years. Um, I've been working as a program manager um, on, on these kinds of projects um, for the last four years. Um, on a personal level, um, I feel very connected to, 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 to us as, as global citizens and on, on a professional level, I've been um, managing sports-based programs um, here in Catalonia, Italy, Greece, Denmark, um, Lebanon, um, and a couple of other uh, countries as well. So um, we, I think from a from a club and, and foundation perspective, I think where we can make the most impact is by operating on a number of different levels and by leveraging um, the, the uniqueness that, that Barca Foundation have, right? So on, a, on, a, on an obvious level, uh, we have the, the brand of FC Barcelona, right? And, 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 and um, although Fresh is not a fan, <laughs> most people are. <laughs> and um, it's, 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 it's the thing that, um, you know, is, is um, 
you know, it, 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 it promotes appeal, it, it intrigue, interest. Um, it's the thing that makes people show up. Um, but I think then what you do with that brand is in, in my, uh, is another thing. Um, from a communication standpoint, so over the past few years, Barca Foundation, we, you know, we've got this um, approach to communications and storytelling, which is about um, focusing in on, on the human, on the individual, on the person, much more than um, kind of politicizing um, someone for their, for their political status or religion or geography and so on. So I think by focusing on the person, we can transcend a lot of the stigmas and barriers and, um, and we're able, you know, we have a massive platform that we're able to, to celebrate, like just the really incredible people and stories. Um, and then um, on a partnership level, so Fair Network is a really good example of, um, of, a, of a, a collaboration where we contribute our um, know-how and, and networks and, 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 and contacts and, and in return we also get exposed to really good projects uh, around Europe. Um, many of the initiatives and organizations we collaborate with on a programmatic basis thanks to being part of networks like FAIR that, that enable us to, to, to know more about different organizations um, and then on a, on a programmatic level, on a practical level, the, 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 pro, the programs that we deliver in, in, in here in Catalonia and in different countries, um, all, all, we always have a purposeful methodology. So it's in, intentionally designing programs. And again, inspires the Inspires research project or the research that I've been doing is been looking at what are the mechanisms and what are the um, considerations for good design of projects to, that are inclusive, that are um, you know that are accessible, that are fun, engaging, and, and all of this kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I think long-winded way of answering your question, Ben. But um, we are committed and involved on a number of different levels, um, and so the Inspires project and, and the collaboration with their network is a is a complete you know it's a, it's a natural uh, fit for us. And when you seek a partner, Lucy, how much of the programs, I know that it will differ from example to example, but how much do you try and strive to produce or lead in-house comparative to a reliance on your partner and or other third parties? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that actually, Ben, because um, we, we were just talking a little bit offline um, before how um, the, the project here in, in uh, Barcelona is is in collaboration with a brilliant um, football NGO called Ramasa. Thresh mentioned it in her opening talk. So Ramasa, if anybody's not familiar, it's one of the initiatives that I put forward um, to the Inspires uh, Network, the Inspires Project. Um, it, it has since been shared around with our Finland partners and Greek partners. Um, it's a small NGO here in Catalonia. They've been running social programs that contribute to the sustainable development goals for, for a long time. Um, Barca Foundation, actually, um, we started to collaborate with Ramasa from September onwards, so for this season. Um, and um, so I think to your question about um, to, the, to what extent we deliver our own programs versus work with other collaborative, you know, collaborations with different organizations, we that is a way that we, we would typically work in most of our programs in all the countries around the world, including on our front door, so here in Catalonia. So the benefits of working with Ramasa is that it's an agile, it's a small organization. Um, they have been in operation for many years. Um, they have a, a lot of links and connections with social entities where the um, women in, in this project's case, so people like Reshta, who have been assigned to a social organization to guide them through the asylum process, um, it's, they're very well connected to these social organizations. So um, they can overcome the challenges of identifying participants, you know, recru recruiting uh, women into the project, um, you know, recruiting volunteers, um, and it's also a way of um, providing support and, and, and contributing resources and, and transferring uh, methodology. And so, you know, helping, to, helping Ramasa in this case and, and uh, you know, helping them to also grow as an organization institutionally and on their own work in using football and sports to, to promote social inclusion. So um, 
yeah, Ramasai is a brilliant uh, organization. Um, we very much feel part of the Ramasai family as well. Um, and it's, it's a brilliant collaboration. I think what, what um, Ramasai brings a very like grassroots family feel, right? Like um, they have a men's uh, amateur football team. Many of the men on the team are volunteers. We see them every week. Um, their president, who's uh, Pera, he's uh, in his 60s. He, he plays with us every week. Um, and <laughs> and um, the, the, what, what Barca Foundation brings in this case is um, access to additional funding, resources, connection to a European project. Um, you know, we, we support with uh, venue and, and kit and things like that, but it's really about, you know, aligning on, on where, you know, on our best, uh, yeah, best fit. Um, and we do that in, in many of the countries where we work. So, um, yeah, Girl Power Organization, I know not on the, not presenting today, but um, a part of um, the FAIR network as well is, a, is an implementation partner that, that we're working with in, in Denmark and Germany as well. Brilliant stuff. Let's take a question from Anna Guzman in the chat, Lucy. You mentioned methodology before, and Anna asks, do you have to adapt your methodology depending on refugees' background, or do you usually apply the same program regardless of origin, stories, and so on? Yeah, I think there's a couple of couple of considerations. One is the, the design of the overall program or overall intervention. So typically the coach, female coach, will have a social education kind of psychology background. I think that's important for, um, for creating a safe, positive environment, for um, tuning into and listening to, to different needs. We, we have a lot of different languages in our session as well. <laughs> Um, we have probably around 12 different nationalities represented, probably as many languages. So having that social education role is, is very important. That person is then trained to deliver the methodology that, that we're talking about. Um, other project design elements include um, providing childcare for, for um, some of the women who are mothers. Um, uh, Anita, um, for Esther's sister, for example. Um, the, the women with, with children wouldn't be able to come to the sports session if, if the childcare provision wasn't, wasn't there. Um, and uh, physical space as well. So having a, re having a regular access to a space is also in a, in another important consideration in the project design. Um, when it comes to the methodology, so um, We've been developing and, and updating um, sports-based methodologies within the Barca Foundation for, for the last yeah, 10 years or so. Um, we have different methodologies for different aged, uh, age groups. So for, for younger children, um, for, for uh, older people, we have um, adapted methodologies for um, people with um, intellectual disabilities, um, we've got um, methodologies that have different thematic topics that are, are addressed. So, um, in, you know, it might be whether it's promoting life skills or values or um, different social skills for different age groups of um, children and young people. So in the case of um, the specific methodology that is deployed in this project with refugee women, bearing in mind that we have women from 12 different countries, we have um, so many different nationalities, we have so many different ages, I think it become more, yeah, oh yeah, and this is growing. Um, I think the youngest is probably, what, 18, and the oldest is, yeah, maybe 15, yeah. So um, the, the, the methodology focuses much more on, um, on creating circles, create uh, situations where all of the women are listened to and heard and understood where possible on, on um, games and dynamics that are, that are cooperative and fun, um, not you know, much less on competition. Then there's a demand for basic football skill. So we do do some drills, don't we, with um, learning football. Um, we typically have, have matches because everyone gets excited about matches. Um, but then after the match, there's an intentional closing as well. So there's a structure to the, to the methodology. It's, I would say because it's with um, so many different nationalities, with older women, um, 
and quite a lot of women, it's probably less structured than, say, the methodology that we deliver with children, for example. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, you have to adapt. And within that adaption, my final question, Lucy, is what are the measures of success? Because I think when a programme has an affiliation to a big club, people perhaps look at success in quite a front-facing media attention grabbing way and they kind of think would a football club put money down would a football club campaign and we'll see that with Ukraine where sport makes a very public message and there's been examples for example of Barcelona where a young Afghan refugee made headlines because he made a messy Argentina shirt out of a blue and white bag and then he got in the media and these are all great aren't they but that's one aspect of how the club can be socially conscious. But what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of judging success feels far more practical. So is it fair to sort of say that your gauge of success is not about how much digital impressions you get or how much media headlines you grab? That's a part of it when any football club is being socially conscious, but it's about that direct impact with the refugee, helping them settle, helping them make friends, helping them make a language, providing them, as you've already said, with things like daycare. Is that more from the Barcelona Foundation's perspective rather than Barcelona's perspective, your measure for success in all of this? Yeah, so um, Barcelona Foundation, we are a, a department of the club, but also a, a, a foundation um, governed by by you know we're a Catalan foundation governed by Spanish law so our objectives are inherently social right we um we receive support from the club so um for for many years now um 0.7 percent of the club's um annual revenue goes to the foundation that's a, a, a good um, financial commitment um a percentage of player salaries goes um, from the players to, to the, to the um, foundation. Um, sponsors of the club as well often have um, social elements and we're well positioned to, 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 to deliver on these social elements that aren't about business objectives and, and reach and, and, and so on. I think we utilize the digital reach to enhance the work that we're doing and to amplify the work that we're doing. So, um, we have a lot of different programs. We have um, you know, education focused programs, health uh, focused programs, social inclusion focused programs. Each program will have its own um, objectives, activities, um, ways to, to, to monitor and ways to understand, you know, to, to, to understand what change we're having, what impact we're having. Um, individual testimonies. Um, are really important because they validate um, the work that we're doing. Um, the, there's a continuous um, cycle of improvement and learning um, at all levels, whether it's from the coach, participants, coaches, coordinators, program managers like myself. Um, there's it's it, revisions of, of methodologies, revision of project design. Um, there's a there's a real um, commitment to to improving and, and learning, I think, internally. Um, and yeah, I mean, we have our own metrics of, of what success is. I mean, one of the things right now with Barca Foundation is um, we, we, we're just starting a new strategic cycle. Um, and the last strategic cycle, um, social inclusion of, of refugees and migrants was a big priority. Um, the good news is that we're moving into the new strategic cycle with the same, um, if, more, if not more, emphasis on, on refugees and, and migrants as part of the Barca family and community. Um, the the programmes that, that we're running now and that we're trying to, we're almost trying to pivot and transition the programmes that we're running to have greater impact, actually, because for the past few years, we've been running sport-based programs and that might be uh, in the case here on a weekly basis or on a twice weekly basis or wherever. Um, but there's an, our new director is, is kind of tasking us to say, what else can we do? Um, we have enormous potential, enormous power. Um, and how can we almost like revisit 
the you know having I mean countless conversations with Fresh, for example, to 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 know how to design um, sports programs, but also what else do do the people in our programs need, and what other challenges are they facing? Is that you know, and that might be around um, educational needs, training needs, job. Um, finding a job like there there are so many other areas that we could um, potentially impact through different types of either partnerships or interventions um, and we're very aware of that that um, almost feel like we scratch the surface sometimes so um, I think this season and coming seasons we are um, maybe consolidating a little bit what we've been doing and going deeper in some of the areas that we're working um, not spreading as thinly, but um, yeah, so so we hope that with the, the project here in Catalonia, and we have 30 women, uh, and we have, you know, amazing sessions every week, but we're thinking about this is an anchor to then do other stuff as well. So what what other stuff um, should we do? And this is where the listening to Bresta and the social entities and the social workers who are involved in this space and understand what you know because yeah the, the asylum process are, are really really important so for us as program managers to to shape um decisions based on that great stuff lucy thank you very much indeed that was really insightful and i think we've all got a better understanding now of what the barcelona foundation do but how you seek partners as well and I know that Celeste has got a question, which I'll come back to at the end. Anyone that's got any feedback or questions for any of our panelists can put them into the Q&A or the chat. And then at the end, we'll bring everyone back for between five and 10 minutes and put your questions. So Celeste, I've not forgotten you. Thank you so much for your input, but we will move on to the next panel now. And then at the end, we'll bring Lucy back in and we'll take your question, which I think is a good one. And some of the other panelists may have some input as well. But let's move on now. Thanks again to Lucy for telling us a bit more about the Barcelona Foundation and how they work with various partners and specifically their relationship, of course, with the fair network and from there we will broaden things a little bit to discuss the role of sport in refugee policy so if you are late to this session we've already looked at the co-creation program which is a case study in Australia from one of our Inspires developers, that's Anna Farello. We've spoken about Fereshta's journey from Afghanistan to Barcelona, and she's part of the Barca Foundation's program with Fair Network. And then we've looked at how a big club like Barcelona finds a partner and the balance, if you like, between third party input and the foundation or the club itself. And now we're going to hear from Des Tomlinson from the Football Association of Ireland and Nagim Ravand, who is a refugee football coach in Denmark. And what we're trying to delve into for the next 15 or 20 minutes is refugee policy in sport. So as refugees and asylum seekers face increasingly hostile environments as they arrive in European countries, how can sport help them integrate? And Des can speak about the Football Association of Ireland and their strategy of inclusion, specifically around young women. And Nagin can tell us about the coach's perspective and how coaches can be mentors, role models, and show pathways. And Nagin, if I can start with you, because I think what's really important in all of this when we're shaping a policy is not only to seek feedback from refugees and have a clear strategy, but also show young women exactly what they can be. You know, it's more than a cliche, isn't it? When people say, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And it's very comforting to a young refugee woman to turn up to a sports session and see that pathway from someone who's been through their journey because they immediately then feel integrated. So how important do you think the role of a coach is in developing refugee policy in sport? You're really right. Um, I think it's, it's crucial to the process. And, you know, 
yeah, of course, we're we're talking about refugees. We should also talk with them. And that's why it's so important that when we are in the decision-making processes that we involve the people we are actually trying to make a difference for. And, you know, my role has been crucial here in Denmark because, you know, to my surprise, probably also yours, there are football clubs here without a single female member. And it's especially in the, uh, you know, socially exposed neighborhoods and I live in one of those and you know today fortunately we have more females playing especially those with minority backgrounds and the only reason for that was because of representation because of someone taking the first step forward showing that it's okay to break the norms and break the traditions and that you can do it without compromising with your values your religion your tradition um so so the importance was that the leader was someone they could reflect themselves in and then they start feeling comfort because it meant that we do not have to change ourselves to become a part of society and to integrate or you know what i believe is better than integration is inclusion um and and you know that's why we need to put people next to us instead of talking to them like they're under us right um, so it's it's really important, and I became a football coach for that reason to show representation matters, and that it makes the biggest difference rather than giving a pair of free football boots or whatever you know resources might be in the way or a barrier. The the most imp important thing is information, and sometimes information comes in forms of representation. And Des, is it fair to say that you almost need a sub strategy from the perspective of a federation or football association? So the Football Association of Ireland effectively needs one, an inclusion policy for, let's say, refugees, and then two, needs a gender specific inclusion policy for refugees. So there's two aspects to it. Yeah, um, I'm not actually sure. Um, I think there's this question of do, do you mainstream activity? So do you have an overarching strategy? And within that strategy, you make sure um, that one of the fundamental parts of that strategy is, in, is inclusion, um, uh, is, is representation, or do you do um, something that's tailored? So uh, I think for us, we've probably done both over the years. We have a main, an, an overarching strategy and then also look to have some tailored activities. Um, I, I take McGean's point around, um, you know, I suppose I might categorize this as, um, you know, um, do you in, empower people to uh, take actions? Do you set up a, a, a structure and a system that helps people to take actions or are you just benevolent in your approach? And I think that's, that's quite important that you do think about, well, yes, do we develop an overarching strategy that has very clear fundamentals around inclusion? Do we do something tailored? And I think the need for tailored activities has to be something that comes um, from the ground, from people. But if people are saying this, we, we, we do require some specific tailored uh, activities or specific tailored strategies. So yeah, I'm, I'm unsure actually, whether or not you, you, you need to do um, always to develop something that, that is tailored. It's an interesting point, isn't it, Nagin? Because you want a strategy, and with that strategy comes support and funding and structure, but you're a coach on the ground. And as soon as you walk out there and interact with a young refugee woman, you realize that just saying that term is quite general. And every refugee will have a different story, some more traumatic than others. And you do have to, at times, adapt and tailor the approach. So how as a coach do you on the one hand try and fulfill an overarching strategy which as Des says can be vital and helps create unity and helps gain funding behind a program but then on the ground how do you be more spontaneous and adapt to make sure that you are indeed working with the needs of the individual rather than implementing something that could be too generic and thus less impactful? I think to me, it's actually cool to hear 
test saying he's unsure because that's actually also how it should be. It's almost impossible to tailor a specific program because what you need in this area is to be flexible and do not have some kind of, you know, uh, recipe that you're following because if you do that you will get stuck and you will feel like it's not working you need to take case by case human by human because we are all different and yeah I'm a football coach but when I get out there in the field I do not feel like one because I, I use 80% of the time not talking about football I use that 80% of being just a human being trying to understand each individual story, find out how I can help them develop. Because in the end, I'm just a tool for them to access and to help, you know, them reach their full potential to figure out what are they good at through football. So they don't have to be the best players. They don't have to like have some kind of football talent. They just need to attend there to have fun, to find confidence to find out and feel, get in touch with their inner selves, to find out what, where am I and stand on their feet because they just traveled from across the world and everything is falling apart for them. So we, we need to not have a plan of what we wanna do and instead ask them, what is your plan? What are your dreams? What do you need and what can I do for you? And then see, okay, she has a plan. She has a tailored plan way a journey that she wants to go so what can i do to help her and so so like i don't know if it makes sense but the the plan is to be flexible the plan is to be spontaneous and it's just perfect if we can line up uh storage of resources of funds that we have available but we do not need to force them into use we need to have them until they're asked for and we need to make sure we enlighten and give information about the availability of these stuff. Um, even the sport itself is a huge resource, but to many families, it's, it's not the norm to play football for girls and women, so they don't know it's an opportunity. So we have the obligation to create awareness of it, but not the obligation of forcing them to use it, right? Because it has to come from within. So yeah, <laughs> those are a bit of different things. <laughs> No, I think that point is well said, and it's so crucial as you started in the answer to remain flexible and adapt. And there's, there's that relationship, as we've already said, between the coaches and the people running programs for, in this case, refugee women and the federations or leagues and clubs. And it's a two-way input. And then from your point of view in Ireland, there's the same two-way input between you and the football clubs. So if you remove the programs from the equation for now, and we think more strategically, if you as an FA want to do something in this sphere, you need buy-in from your clubs and vice versa. If a club wants to do something, they very often need buy-in from their football association. So talk a little bit about the importance of that relationship and how difficult or easy it is to get a unified buy-in in this sphere between the federation and all of its clubs yeah a really important question um federations are federations and uh, you know if you think of it as a pyramid you know the, the biggest base of football or sport is that participation base uh, nationally around around the country um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll try and capture it in a couple of ways, really, that, that, that helps me and hopefully helps others to understand maybe the perspective that I take or that we take. So, um, one of the first things when I started my job, 2006, and, and Ireland has changed in terms of its uh, cultural demographic makeup significantly, 13% of the population now from quote unquote non-Irish national backgrounds is a terminology used in the census, but from diverse backgrounds. So going from a country that was quite uh, homogeneous to one that's much more pluralistic. Um, so within that, one of the first things that we, we thought about was what are, what are the barriers and enablers to participation? And one of the things that we came up with is this acronym KICK. It's about knowledge, information, contact opportunities. But when we thought, thought about KICK, we thought about KICK on both sides. So what does that mean to the knowledge information for people that are uh, in, in look, seeking international protection or have international protection, what does that also look like for a club? What kind of information does a club require? Um, 
and, and where, where are the contact opportunities? What kind of contact opportunities do you put together that might work for a club that's in a very maybe rural setting uh, compared to a club that's a larger club that has more resources? What, what do those contact opportunities look like? So I think one of the things that we've done is that we, in, in the programme that we, we developed along with um, funding from the Southern Migration Integration Fund from the state was integration through football. And that project was about uh, developing partnerships, so partnerships with clubs and partnership with um, civil civil society organisations or NGOs that are working with people from diverse backgrounds and diverse refugee uh, or asylum seeking backgrounds and diverse backgrounds in general. And why that is important is because just as Nagin is saying, it's about developing an understanding of each. And as a national federation, we cannot do that everywhere in the country as a national federation, but we can try to facilitate um, that happening by building these, these bridges and building these connections. So I think how we do that, that, that is, is really important about those partnerships, those local partnerships uh, between the clubs and between uh, the local partners to, to bridge that connection between um, people that want to take part or want to think about taking part in, in football. And when I say taking part, I just want to clarify that. So for us, that's not just um, playing football which is often what people understand. So it's playing football, it's refereeing, being an official, it's coaching, again, yourself, you're coaching, uh, it's being an administrator, it's being involved in, in football, in all facets of, of football. And I'll pick up on that in a moment, Des, but I wanna just bring in Nagin, so squeeze in a question from Patricia, who in the chat has asked, do you ever see family conflict when, for example, daughters want to play sport, but their parents are not on board? And Patricia is asking if you've got any tips on the ground, if you like, for navigating this. Yeah, um, I mean, every, every family is different. For some it's cultural, for some it's religious, um, but in, in my neighborhood, it's definitely also been a conflict because the majority are Middle East, Eastern families. And there have been a couple of families where I've had to, you know, get up to the parents and talk to them myself because they wouldn't allow their girls. And I learned that the reasons were because football, the only thing it meant to them was trouble. And um, that's because that's what it is in their home country. Football is trouble. Sport is trouble because it means going out, exercising, moving your body in specific ways. And will boys look in? Will they have the freedom to do it without anyone keeping an eye or whatever. Um, so it's also a lot about society and others people, other people's watching. Um, but it was also a lot about them not even having the image of girls playing inside of their heads because it wasn't normal where they came from until they came to, for example, Denmark, they have seen girls play, but not girls looking like their daughters. And a lot of their worries were, and that it, it's not funny, but it made me laugh. It was will my daughter have to play in shorts? We can't have her do that. And I laughed because I found it, you know, unbelievable that you would think you would have to wear shorts to play football and that you couldn't do it in pants because you were wearing the hijab or have a shirt underneath because all the girls you see on TV or outside playing in other clubs, they all look alike, blonde hair, shorts and t-shirt. So what will the little Somali with the hijab do? when she usually wears skirts and abayas or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I understood her totally because I didn't even know what I was supposed to answer her. Back then I wasn't wearing the hijab either. So I couldn't even see a uniform inside of my head. What will she do? And that's something I, I think the FAs have a responsibility of creating kids that involve pants and shirts with long sleeves and a hijab that Nike has recently developed. It's very simple, but it's so important and such a big barrier for some families to find a coach who understands the traditions, the norms. And that's where me, myself as a coach, I've been very effective because I look like the girls and their families. So me talking to them works. Whereas if Lucy talks to them, maybe they will just believe it's just another Western woman trying to convince us to follow their footsteps. So it actually matters who picks up the conversation when they're very, very tight and very close to change. Um, so, so these are different paths you should have in mind 
um, because it's sensitive and especially when it's religious. Um, so I can't give you the, the right answer, but these were some of the con con concerns I've been involved with. And in the end, it turned out great. We took it one step at a time, one piece of clothes at a time. Um, yeah. And I think that's really well said. And the way that you are able to have an affinity with the generation of young refugees below you age-wise and show them those pathways and give them a familiar face from the same background that shares part of the story is definitely a kind of in point to making them feel comfortable and from there integrating them into widish Danish community, if you like. And, you know, that's one aspect, isn't it, Des, of actually dealing with situations on the ground. But I'm interested coming back to what you were talking about before, about how you kind of mobilize before this type of situation happens. So if there's an influx of refugees from a variety of places, there'll be a strategy within football, there'll be programs, there'll be integration, and we've touched upon that. But what about kind of before it happens? And I obviously asked this in the context of Ukraine to some extent, but please answer in a way that you're most comfortable with, whether it's specific to the Ukraine situation or whether it's more general. But what I'm getting at is how as an FA, when you have an ongoing volatile situation, whether it's the Taliban's reoccupation of Afghanistan or whether it's Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how do you like mobilize before the refugees from that particular crisis arrive? How do you come up with a unified response? How strong can that unified response be? How quickly do you talk to your clubs? Who's sort of leading that conversation? So if it's Ukraine and you decide, we as the Football Association of Ireland are not gonna play against Russia, which we've seen from Poland, which we've seen from the Czech Republic, which we've seen from Sweden. How do you come up with that unified response or mobilization? And what advice have you got to other people on this call as the first steps? Because if someone turns around to you and says, Des, we need a position on Ukraine, that can be quite daunting, but you've got to not only find that position, but find it quickly. Yeah, I mean, there's, two, there's a couple of questions in there. Um, and I think uh, maybe just address the first one firstly. So in terms of finding a, a position on, 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 a, on a crisis such as Ukraine, um, I think that's about where the FBI stands in terms of, you know, is this something that we want to support in terms of playing our qualifying matches or not playing our qualifying matches? And, and you know, overall it is that we want to support by not, not playing the qualifying matches. Um, I think in terms of what we're looking at in, in terms of how do you mobilize when, when uh, uh, a crisis, for want of a better word, uh, occurs, that's really about the relationships that you have. Um, so actually I was just off a call earlier on today with a refugee resettlement worker in the west of Ireland where we have run programs. Um, and really it's about linking in with those partners at that grassroots level, but also at the state level so you can understand you know, what the state is doing, because the FBI uh, or any governing body has no um, visibility around, say, when programme refugees are going to arrive in Ireland. But we do have the ability to prepare by making sure we have good relationships with relevant agencies. And I think that, that's what I would say is that um, for national governing bodies about how do you develop those relationships with relevant state actors, relevant actors uh, on the ground uh, ahead of time. That's really useful. And I think it's interesting that part of the mobilization is naturally in the speed with which you work, but part of it is kind of by the sounds of things anyway, learning from previous experiences. So you're aware of who to turn to, which partners to integrate. And that makes it a lot easier because then you're bringing in experts from different fields to come up with a response that is a little bit more considered despite the urgency or frenzy of the situation and Ukraine is obviously a good example of that where people expect a sports federation to take a stance quickly and fast and for it to be the most powerful kind of position possible but that can sometimes take a little bit of time because you have to preempt the situation outside of sport which is ultimately very political and work out a considered 
but still very powerful response within that. So I think that was a very clear and useful explanation to everybody. And if anyone has any further questions on that, I'm sure at the end or offline, Des will be happy to take them. And Nagin, just add that, please go so, for it. Yeah, look, just, just to quickly add, I think it's really important to sort of understand that um, sport is, is a player on, on, on the field. I and mean, it's an important player, but it's not the only player. You know, just like playing, it's not the only player. And I think if people are wanting to work with people uh, that are from diverse refugee or asylum seeking backgrounds, really, really want to do that work, then it's really, really important to recognize what you can do and where you don't have competencies and where you need to build those competencies with relevant agencies. And I think that from a sustainability perspective, long term perspective, uh, I think that's crucial. Yeah, really good point. And again, the final word to you. I think that sometimes when refugees, particularly from certain parts of the world where there's been a real fear factor around playing sport, can naturally feel very shy and they can, rightly so, because they are victims, buy into that kind of victim stereotype and it can be quite hard for them to find the confidence when they become safe, even after they become integrated, to move away from being victims. And that is, as I say, because unfortunately, we have to accept that refugees, an aspect of them are that they are victims. And that's why we must embrace them and educate around them. They're not threats, they're victims. And I can't stress that enough. But hopefully we get to a point through your programs where they feel settled and confident and they have a life in their new country and sport helps that. And at that point, What's your advice to then use programs like this to get the refugee more out of their shell so then they can say, well, hang on a minute, I don't just have to accept my fate, my geography, my circumstance, I can now transition because I see those pathways into living a more, for want of a better phrase, permanent life. And within that permanent life, they can start thinking about growing their leadership skills, growing their education, or potentially through sport. And I think this is a really key point and useful way to close this discussion. So my question to you is, how can a young refugee woman that has potentially been victimized transition into a lifestyle that's more confident and in doing so turn from refugee to leader? That's the perfect question for me, because I always say I stand for challenging the odds and I encourage everyone else to do so, too, because, yeah, I was a refugee, too, and it's a part of my identity. But now I'm more likely to say former refugee, because in the end, I'm a citizen, I'm civilized now and I'm helping others transform and change their lives now. Um, and my my advice to all of these organizations and FAs trying to do a difference and help on this matter is to give away responsibility. Do not try to take the position of saviors because nobody wants to be saved or feel like someone is in the position of receiving charity. Let's give these women and girls some responsibility after they've attended practice for a year let's give them some responsibility of coaching give them some young girls that they can coach and mentor or or just pass on something they're good at because they want to these girls and women come from a home country where they were hella good at something and now they're coming and starting all over so they are thirsty after feeling useful so make them feel useful um that's that's my biggest advice and yeah as this said sport is is just one way of doing so. Maybe there are they're good at so me. Then help make them control your Instagram or whatever. Use them. They like it. They love it, and it helps them develop, get confidence, and and feel like the true leader they're about to become. Yeah, great stuff. Really, really well put, both of you. Excellent discussion. I wish that we could continue this. And for once, by the way, in a fair panel that I'm hosting, we're pretty much on time. So everyone's going to get away for an early dinner relatively based upon the schedule to the minute as we put it. But we do have about five minutes left. And what I'm going to do at this point is just bring all of our other panelists in and allow everyone to have uh, closing thoughts, which means now if we overrun, you can pin it on the individual panelists for delaying your dinner because I've taken you to this final finale with everybody in the same shot. 
relatively to the dot on time. And I'm just going to start with a couple of questions to allow everybody to kind of come up with a few closing thoughts. But if whilst we're having this discussion, you've got anything to add, please stick it in the chat and we'll put it to the panelists. And the first question, and anyone can feel free to come in here, but Lucy Mills, why don't you start because this was a question raised to you during your panel. Celeste Williams says, what general advice can you give on overcoming cultural barriers for refugee women in sport, especially the idea that women should stay at home? If we are working with younger women, teens, for example, Celeste says, how do we show appreciation for the home culture and respect for family expectations whilst also encouraging women in sport? And Lucy, if you start here, but if anyone else on the panel off the back of Lucy wants to contribute, please feel free. Yeah, I mean, this question came in before Nagin's um, talk, right? So, I mean, Nagin just um, spoke to this um, topic like perfectly, eloquently, and and um, I mean, I guess from a, you know investing in programs perspective, um, creating spaces perspective, um, I completely agree with Nagin in saying that you know that, that we're talking about individual people and a lot of different. Uh, backgrounds, different nationalities, different languages. Um, we were just having a conversation then when the question came up about should we mix men and women, and, and she was like, "Oh, it's great because we often we often do that at times as well." But um, and then we have m m women who you know more conservative backgrounds. We have women in in, um, in Nike, hijabs. We had a donation recently, so I think it's just it's being in tune to, to to the nuances and the differences, and actually when. We have so much fun, you know. Ultimately, it's about connecting on a human level, and um, I mean, our sessions are hilarious, aren't they? And and because we we embrace this difference, so um, I think it 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 takes. I think for us, it, it took time to find women in the first place. Um, but once the women, once we we found them, let's say now the floodgates are open and we have so many women and it's just so so it's such a positive energizing space uh, it's the highlight of my week um for sure and um so i think i would just defer to nagin and, and everything that she said to properly answer that question that celeste brought up <laughs> yeah again you're nodding away anything to add no i mean i think i think that's yeah what Lucy said and what I said before, we'll, we'll be able to do it. And you know, if you should mix men and women is also relative. My first intuition would have been saying no. Although when I was younger, I loved it when we mixed the girls and the boys together. But if you want everyone to join in, you gotta take small steps. So start by separating, finding the love for the game. And then later it won't matter who you're playing with because what matters is football. Um, so, so mix, but do it like carefully. And for those that didn't see the question that Lucy referred to, it's in the chat, it came in from Tula and it was, we're doing inclusion through sports and we mix men and women. What's your opinion about mixing men and women together? And that has been partially answered in a kind of amalgamation of the previous question by Lucy and Nagim. But Anna, what did the kind of feedback from specifically the programs perspective in Australia show on that was there a openness and an appetite from those involved to have mixed gender programs or given some of the cultural sensitivities in asia and the middle east and north africa were single sex programs for refugees that are new to a country deemed to be more preferable by the participants yeah great question so um obviously the the case study that i presented was was yeah a young woman only and i i think I'm not exactly sure where all of the women came from, um, but I guess my answer would just be to ask and to get their thoughts on on how they feel and to make sure that there is some collective agreement on on ways forward. And by working with them and getting their input, you know that that's going to be what they want because they're they're hopefully giving you authentic answers. So um, I think that would just be my piece. And then I'm just going to read a comment from ISAT to the group in case people didn't see it. And it says, thanks, very true, most especially it got to do with culture, which 
I think is a slight typo, but effectively we're focusing on the culture aspect. And what's being said is that from what I went through and the experience I had, I wasn't allowed to play soccer. I had to run away from home to play coming back, which I knew would get a beating and punishment. So for Esther, this is sort of something that you've already alluded to and the full message in the chat. But what's being basically said is that I was very focused and somehow stubborn and it made me kind of stronger and more passionate for football as a Muslim, but it wasn't easy to play. And one of the challenges here in the story, and it's a really interesting story that is in the chat, so I encourage you to read it in full. The kind of end of it speaks about how the Muslim background uh, made it very difficult to play soccer to begin with, but then became a kind of badge of representation and honor. And there's also a, a, an interesting um, kind of closing to this as well uh, about being a sort of girl child that can champion football and having succeeded in sport after facing cultural barriers. When you then go back with that success story, you can kind of win over your community. So please do give a really fascinating message from Ayasat in the chat, a full read. And for Eshta, perhaps I can kind of get your comment on it because this is a very familiar story, isn't it? Of a young girl wants to play football, but there's a worry about the gear. There's a worry about how the family will receive it. There's a worry about getting beaten. And there's this threat, there's this target hovering over young girls in many different parts of the world. And it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? To even play sport, something as simple, something as enjoyable to most of us from perhaps more privileged backgrounds of sport. In certain parts of the world, like Afghanistan, there's a fear around playing sport. So what advice have you got to young girls listening to this panel that are still fearful of playing sport? Um, thank you so much. My advice or my suggestion for them is that to continue because um, when you play a sport, you forget all of the things that happen in your life, negative things. And um, a sport get all of the negative energy from your body, from your mind. Because of that, I want every woman in the countries like Afghanistan, like the Syria, access to the sport and access to this opportunity and do it. Thank you very much. And again, to both of you, Lucy and Fareshta, and to Anna and Nagin, your insights and the way that you lucidly put across your points has been much appreciated. Des, I'm gonna give you the final word here, summing up, up from the perspective of an FA. And I think what would probably be quite useful to close on is, for you to give a general overview, because on this call, we've got programmers, we've got coaches, we've got athletes. How do you think federations should kind of lead the global conversation rather than the country specific conversation? Because I think there'll be people on this call that hear you speak and think, he's brilliant. What they're doing in Ireland is brilliant but unfortunately I live somewhere else. So we've spoken about you feeding down to clubs or down to partners and working with them, but what about the feeding up? In other words, in that pyramid you mentioned, how can you as a representative of the Football Association of Ireland get buy-in from other federations on your level to have more of a weighted global voice? And then as you go up your pyramid, how can you put weight on a FIFA, on a UEFA and so on to get stuff done on a more global level. So then if someone's listening and um, they think, oh, maybe the next step in what I'm trying to do is to talk to my federation, but then really I need that support from FIFA or FIFPro or UEFA and so on. How can that federation kind of sit in the middle of that domestic through to global to try and unite something when it's really important to get stuff done outside of just your country alone? I think um, and it's quite an interesting question, actually, because um, there is, is quite a lot of work being done by federations around the country, around around Europe, particularly under um, the UEFA. So you know, a lot of federations have programs in place. They have projects in place. They're not always 
um, profile, and that probably means that people are not so familiar with them. So I guess going back a lot in terms of how do you get it out there, how do you get it on a global scale? I guess it's about profiling um, an association's commitment to including people from diverse refugee backgrounds. So I think that's important, and that 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 would mean you know using all of the resources that are. Uh, a national association has, and particularly at the higher level in terms of the national teams and things like that, to, to carry that message. I think what is important is that it needs to be a fundamental part of what you're doing as a, as a national federation. So uh, in the Republic of Ireland, inclusion is part of what the association wants to do. And I think when it's a fundamental value, then it makes it a bit easier uh, to communicate um, because people understand it's part of what you want to do. It's part of your DNA, for one of the better way of putting it. So how do you do that? How do you, for us, it's important that we communicate that in all of the things that we do and the strategies that we put together. So I think that's important that that happens at a national level. Um, and, and like you say, how do you get that out there um, more broadly? I think that's about how you can communicate that, how you can get that message out there. But not, when I say communicate, I'm really keen not to say um, just to communicate, to, to have a communication tool but actually for it to be part of something that's fundamental uh, to your association and fundamental to, to what you want to do. And I think if you can do that, um, I think you can, you can make a big difference, both at that um, higher level and also within your own uh, national um, uh, circumstance and situation. And just finally, just before we wrap up, a quick question from GEA Cooperativa Social which is obviously the company name rather than the individual, although it'd be a pretty cool name if that was actually your personal name from birth. But the question is just to you, Des, and it asks, does Sport Island as a national public sport institution also support their activities in this field? Is it an important player in sustaining football and sport for refugee women? Yeah, and um, Sport Island provides funding to national governing bodies and Sport Island at the moment are developing a, a diversity inclusion strategy, uh, I guess for the first time. And within that, um, one of the main groups are people from diverse ethnic minority backgrounds, as well as LGBT plus community and people with disability. So yeah, there's a strategic um, movement towards doing that. Um, we would have had funding from, from the state, from our Department of Justice, and also sought funding for European projects. So. Uh, I guess um, having mixed funding uh, is is quite important, um, but but yes, Port Island are, are moving in that uh, direction. Great stuff, Des. Thank you very much indeed, and I can confirm exclusively that GEA Cooperative of Social's real name is Alice. And I'd also just like to come back again and remind you of that message from ISAT because ISAT from memory, correct me if I'm wrong, ISAT went on from her story as a refugee to actually play for the Nigeria national team. And I think she was part, if my memory serves me correct, of the 2007 World Cup. So that's a great story in itself of a young footballer at the time that was able to break through cultural barriers and then become a professional footballer. And the, certainly the last I checked, Ayasat was living in Finland. So that's a really good story. And that just shows you that, you know, our experts are not just our panelists, our experts are also many of our attendees. And that's why your feedback is so, so important. So let's keep this conversation going and let's make sure that we connect. And I'm sure all of our panelists will be happy to do that and talk to you offline as well. But for now, it's a huge thanks to Nagin, to Des, to Lucy at the Barcelona Foundation, to Anna, of course, and right at the very beginning for Reshta as well. All of you have been extremely forthcoming in your opinions, very candid, very lucid, very open, very honest. And I, I think we can all agree this has been an insightful session. So thank you very much indeed to everybody. And just to close briefly before we let you go to your dinners, well, it depends what time scale you're on, but it's certainly dinner for me and my stomach is starting to rumble. But what we've done today is we've broken down this topic into various areas. So the title was about designing sports programs with refugee women. And that's in the context of our Inspires development program here at Fairnet. So the first thing to do is to thank Esther and Fairnet for hosting this panel and also make it clear that that program has a specific global focus 
around refugee women. So if you're on the panel and you're interested in that in your region, then make sure that you contact FAIR to learn more about the programme and how you can utilise it for your particular club, league or federation, because FAIR do great things in this particular area. And then we broke it down into an individual story from Foreshta, and she gave us a perspective as someone that unfortunately recently has had to flee Afghanistan and is now part of the Inspires Development Programme through the Barcelona Foundation. But she also gave us a bit of insight into what it's like to be a human rights activist and a journalist and how important it is to use platforms to educate, but also to show pathways for young girls and refugees around the world. And then we dived into the co-creation program in Australia, and that was Anna's presentation, and that's now in the chat. So if you'd like to read that, please do so. But the key messaging from that was that these programs must be refugee-led or participant-led. So it's really important to seek feedback from those involved to develop and adapt and improve them and think on the ground, because every refugee is different and every country hosting a Inspires program is also different. So it's very important not to be generic and think on our feet. And the research shows that. And as I say, you can read that in the chat from Anna. Then we talked about partnerships. In other words, when FAIR has a program like this, it will seek a partner. And Lucy Mills spoke about Barcelona's relationship with the Inspires Development Program. And one of the key takeaways that Lucy mentioned was that you have to be adaptable when finding a partner to make sure that you as a brand or a club input but also be sure to seek the advice of the experts and your third parties so it's a very collaborative effort and the gauge of success is very practical so it's about making sure that on a one-on-one -on -one level in a group level you're showing pathways you're providing things like daycare if necessary so people can play sport and that you're ensuring fundamentally that sport integrates itself and therefore the refugees that are a part of it into whatever society they're within and that's crucial because we all know that sport is a kind of common language so there's no point in having these programs if by playing them there's not that wider purpose of integration within the community and then finally we've had a great discussion between des and Nagin, unfortunately chaired by me, but the, the other two were very strong. And we've learned about the perspective of a football association and a coach on the ground. So two polar extremes in many ways, but the way that they interact and are linked together is very valuable. And your questions have helped kind of guide that particular discussion in a very useful manner too. So I'd just like to close by once again, thanking Esther and Fair and saying, please do reach out to her if you'd like to be connected with anybody, but also if you'd like to learn more about what FAIR do, because these kind of panels are regular occurrences. And then finally, just a big thank you once again to all of you for listening and to Nagin, to Des, to Lucy, to Foreshta, and to Anna as well for giving us an hour and a half or so of your time. So with that, I'll bring things to a close. And once again, thanks for speaking to our speakers. Thanks for joining us for our listeners and thanks to FAIR for putting on this panel. And everybody have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thanks, time. Ben. Nice to meet everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.